Okay, our next speaker is Sean Chalmers. Sean likes writing motorcycles, lenses, and text editors, and software that works, and also writing documentation for some reason. He hates not having errors as values, not being able to use lenses, and he hates writing bios. Also a closet game developer working, uh, currently working on combining WebGL and functional reactive programming. Take it away, Sean. Yeah, you applause now. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about cargo culting lenses. Um, so the whole point of the talk is generally, I'm not sure how many, how many of you actually know what lenses are with respect to FP? Right. Um, hopefully you'll know a bit more by the end of the talk, but when looking at lenses or trying to get started on lenses, um, they can actually be a little bit terrifying um, because of the, sh the sheer amount of theory involved in understanding all of their inner workings. Um, that is not this talk. I am skipping all of that and just showing you most of, or what, some of what I know about um, how to actually use lenses. If you want to actually apply them properly, um, or more thoroughly, I guess, um, and really leverage their power, you will need to start poking around in the theory. Um, but to get started, you can just include it and get rolling. So my hope is that, at least with possibly just with the Haskell library for now, um, just get you started on the rote application of lenses. Um, this is how I started using lenses. Um, I know a bit more now than I did then, um, but I will try and answer any questions that you have as we go along. So as I said, I'll mostly be talking about the um, what's available on the lens package for Haskell. Um, lens libraries do exist, or optics libraries do exist in other languages. So there's one for Scala uh, called Monocle. Um, and I believe there's a couple of others as well. There's a couple for OCaml as well. OCaml Optics and OCaml Lens. Um, the OCaml Lens one is based on the F Sharp lens library. Um, there is lenses for, or there are lenses rather for Python and JavaScript, um, but we don't like to talk about those. Um, so in one aspect, lenses are just a combination of a getter and a setter. We good? Excellent, I can go home. So we'll just cover off the simplest, exa like simplest example. Um, this is just Haskell syntax for a data structure called foo. It's got two fields, a name, which is just a text, and a top speed, which is just a wonderfully um, ill-defined int value. Um, and we can use template Haskell to just write the functions for us, so we can just keep going. Um, so when we're using a getter from the lens library, on the left is the normal Haskell syntax. So that's just record field accessor. That's already in the standard library. That's fine. On the right, the foo caret dot camel name, that's a lens. We're using an infix operator um, that Tony mentioned earlier in the talk to view the camel name from the record on the left. But this is a pretty trivial case. Don't get too much out of it, but it's where we go from here that things start to get a bit more interesting. We say we have another data structure, which has the data structure we had, we just had on the previous slide. So now we need to go in a little deeper. Lenses are just functions. They can compose just like normal functions with a couple of other rules that we'll get into a bit later. But if we have a bar that contains the foo that we just saw on the previous slide, to go one deeper, we just compose the next lens of where we want to go. That's it. They're just functions. They just compose as normal functions. Um, and that's the 
record accessor on the bottom. So as I said, lenses are just functions. You can compose them as you would normal ones. And it also means you can actually then have just, you can build larger lenses from smaller ones and then have them defined as, you can give them a name. So you can say, um, what would be a good name? I hate naming things. Um, you could just have camel person's name as a lens, which is implemented as a composition of these two lenses. But we also have setters. And because of how lenses work, the getter is the same function as the setter. It's how we actually use it with respect to the rest of the lens library um, that make it one or the other. Um, so if we combine it with the setter function, um, the setter operator rather, it just becomes a function that takes a text and a foo and turns it into just another foo. So it's a setter and it's a bit nicer to write than the normal record update syntax, which gets really ugly if we have to go any deeper. And for the code golfers among us, you can apply it inline just with reverse apply, which is function, function application just in the opposite direction. Um, so, yeah, so you can also update, you might also want to update values on a record. Um, if we were to use the normal syntax for changing things, so you've got an A and a B and a C that you want to change, normally when you have immutable data, you have to effectively unwrap each level, including the bottom level, change it, and then wrap everything back up again before you get the new version. This is the, um, this is a Java version of updating nested fields for nested classes that I found, um, which seemed to be nice. They were actually checking for null. Um, but you can see how both in, pre in this example and this one, the moment you start having nested data structures, which is very useful, everything, gets, everything goes a little bit sideways. And it, gets, it get, becomes very hard to track. <coughs> but if we want to do that with lenses, things get a little bit easier. Because they're just functions. They compose in the same way that they do when they're getters. So if you compose them here and use the update with a function, function, um, all of that unwrapping and rewrapping is handled for us. And we get a new version of our data structure back with the update applied. And there's also a uh, append operation, which you can use. It's included as one of the hundreds of operators in the lens library that are not as cryptic as they may appear. They have a DSL that we'll get to a bit later. But again, because lenses are just functions, we can compose them and do multiple updates of a single thing, multiple updates of a data structure in one pass. So we have an individual set function here. We set in the top speed to 48. We're setting the name to Sally. And we're running this update function on the camel person on the bar that's passed in. Am I making a little bit of sense? Going too fast? So, so. All right. No one's objecting. Let's keep rolling. So included in the lens library are as I just mentioned, plenty of pre-baked operators. The operators themselves, um, they're just shorthand for a lot of the other functions that already exist in Lens. Um, for example, we saw 
the top one, the percent tilde, that's just update this target with a function. There's a few others. You can do addition, you can do division, um, and you can do uh, monoidal actions. In this case, string concatenation. So it's pretty handy. If you have one update for, if you have a function do updating, it doesn't matter where in the data structure that particular thing sits, you'll be able to compose your lenses down to get to it and run the update. But not everything is stored on nice linear record structures with a defined path to each of them. Sometimes we've just got a list of things that could be empty. Don't know. So what could we do for all the bars that we have, for all the camel names and everything that's on there? Some things we could do, we just maybe we want to get all the names. Maybe we want to set all the speed values because there's a sandstorm at the race or something. What could we do? Like suddenly we're working on a list, but previously we had a single value. Things are getting crazy. It's traverse. It's always traverse. Traverse is a very useful function. Um, and because in this case, because of how traverse is designed, it's able to be composed with lenses. So you can take what is normal, a, normal fun, a normal lens and compose it with traverse and suddenly you get all of the features, most of the features of traverse. So if we want to get all the names of the camels in the list, we can traverse all of the, all of the bars in the list. And then at this point in the traversal, we're actually think, we can actually get to think about just the single element. We don't have to think about the whole list because that's what traverse takes care of. At that point, we're, it's as if we're just looking at one. And then we can just go directly down to the parts we need. And then the to list of operation basically ensures everything that we've done just gets packaged back up in a list. And it works with setters as well. So if we wanted to update all of the speed values in the list, then again, we can compose with traverse, move down to the top speed, and add 10 to each one. So we saw previously that we could use the caret dot as an accessor, as a view. If we give it a lens, we can view the single element that is pointed to by that lens. But if we're working over a traverse, it's not that easy because we've got multiple items. In this case, we can't view the final result as a single element. It's still a list. We can't change that. Um, the top one works because that's a different function. That's to list of. But this doesn't, that won't work. The reason is because when we compose these things, we form a type called the traversal, which we can extend and reuse. We can give it a name, just as we can with composed lenses. Um, and if you're up for it, you can try and write the function if you want. Um, the reason that other function wouldn't necessarily work is because each of the types or the overarching types in the lens library have a hierarchy. And composing two different types of lenses won't all, sometimes it won't work or sometimes it forms a new type of lens. In this particular case, composing a getter with a traversal will yield what's called a fold. So you'll need some way or some, in, some function of indicating how all of these uh, elements will be combined. So we actually saw, we used a fold earlier, this to list of operator. That takes each of the result, each 
element that we've returned and just makes them into a list. Um, a different type of fold is actually the head prism. Sorry, the head function. Um, so if we can look at the list of bars, we can just take the first one off um, and we get an optional value of the first, of the first element in the list um, because we don't want to use partial functions that blow up on empty lists, do we? So this is the lens family tree I was just talking about. So when you compose the different types of lenses, sometimes they'll form a new lens so, or a new branch. So if you compose two getters, you'll still get a getter. Compose two traversals, it's still a traversal. Um, but composing a getter and a traversal will yield a fold. And depending on how it's applied, it will end up as a, it can be used as a setter. So there's lots of other nice things you can do with lens. Um, if you're working in a uh, monad transformer environment, um, lens has instances for the different types of monad transformers, which lets you just work on the values in your environment without use, having to rely on any of the built-in functions. So in this case, we can say we're running in a state T with a foo, so we're just doing we're treating this foo as a mutable variable for the purpose of this uh, computation. We can set it to a new value. We can map over it with a function. Or we can append or m append uh, with a monoidal value. And again, because I keep coming back on this point, if it's a thing, anything in a state t, the lens function, the lens composition of functions still applies. It's still the same effect. So even if you have a complex data structure in your state or reader or something like that, you can access it quite easily using the same lens you would as if it was a pure value. You can also get a little crazy. Remember we looked at multiple updates earlier? Um, you can go wild with doing that by combining them. Um, this is just a data structure I had for a different project. Um, and this was running every frame. Um, so our data structure came in. I set new max and min values. I traversed a list of lines that was stored on the input, stepping them all over a bit, and then added a new data point at the end. Um, this was a lot more, this was actually simpler to write than trying to pull apart the entire structure and update it. Um, plus the types helped a lot. Um, because I didn't have to worry about how I was moving over the data structure or anything like that. So I was able to just express what needed to happen and then all of the, everything else just lined up. So there was a couple of other things that popped up in that update. Um, the underscore point or underscore one, um, they're what's known as a prism. Um, so prisms are a traversal that may become a getter, um, which is probably not very helpful. So lenses work in both directions. They have to by definition. So if you have a text on a record and you have a lens for that text, you can either set the text or get it off. That's just how the types work. Um, but if you have a lens to the first element of a list, that's only partial. You know you may be able to set the first element of a list, um, but there's no guarantee that you actually have the first element of that list. It could be an empty list. So prisms allow you to model that concept of um, partiality in one direction, which comes in very handy. 
So if you wish to access a value that may not be there, or it's a lens that could fail in some way, prisms allow you to actually represent this. So if we have a data structure, a, da a constructor called write, we have a character, just C in there, and then we optionally try to view the left value of this structure. But it's not a left, it's a right. So we get back nothing. But if it is a left, we get back just C, or some C, if you're used to option types. And they can also be used as constructors. So if we have a value five, we uh, review it into the same prism, same function, and then we get back the left five. Um, you can write your own prisms. It's actually not that difficult. There's a good example on the lens documentation for creating a prism for a natural number, which works in one direction if you have a number <coughs> greater than zero, um, but also can go from, say, a natural number to an integer, because that can work. But going from an integer to a natural number is not guaranteed to work. You can also set with prisms, because prisms are traversals. So might do something a bit more interesting. If we have the following JSON input, um, and the mission is to flip the Boolean value on the delta key of that nested element. We know the specific targets that we're after. Um, so we know what we need to change. But for whatever reason, we're not particularly interested in defining a data structure that represents this entire thing. Because maybe this changes every time it comes in. Or it's a throwaway script, or we're just trying to fix something. So we get the first key which is alpha, that could be null. If it's not, we try and get the beta key, that could be null. It also could not be an array, so on and so forth. Checking nulls and wrapping things up and checking the types at different points, or checking that what we're looking at matches our expectations. Um, and if anything's null, we'll just finish. So it's not designed to explode or anything like that. And this is a bit of an exaggeration, but not by much. We've all written code like this. Don't lie to me. Or we could use something like Lens and combine it with one of the packages that's been written on top of um, one of the JSON packages. Because let's face it, none of us are going to de hand decode any of that. Um, and we have prisms and lenses that are provided to us for navigating a data structure in a clear and concise way. So firstly, we look for the key alpha. That's composed with our check for the key beta. That assumes both are objects. Only objects can have keys. Then the next thing is, well, sorry. Beta element is an array. We use the prism because that could fail. It could not be an array or it could not be there. Then we move to index three. And then if that's there, gamma, check if it's an array, move to index two, go to the delta key, see if that's bool, and then run a function on it and flip it. We don't have to, hang, we don't have to hard code the structure of the JSON in our file. Um, we don't have to keep changing it when the JSON structure updates. We have a map to what we need to change, and we can declare it in our code. So yep, the array and bool from the lens ASIN are both prisms again. So if we have something which is that, we can say yeah, it should be an array, and we get back 
may be array. If we have something that we know is an array, we can construct an, an encoded version um, by just going back the other way. So yeah, prisms are still just traversals. So the wacky operators that have been flying around the place actually have some sense and design behind them. Um, if you're the sort of person that's interested in such things, the amount of effort that has been put, you can read the issues and things like that on the lens package. The amount of effort they put into maintaining a consistent grammar across the package is quite impressive. Um, but all of the operators you've seen comply with this grammar. So you're able to, f it lets you form an idea of what you think, like if you know what you need to do, then you're able to put these parts together and there's a pretty good chance to be able to find the operator you need. Um, so yeah, so if the results are optional, the operator have a question mark in it. If we're just running a single, simple function, percent, something more advanced, double percent. Um, and this one's good if the period is present in the lens operator. The side, it tells you which side the lenses need to be composed on. Which is very handy if things look a bit weird. So again, based on that, we can go, ah, did you catch that? Um, compose the lenses on the left, and then we set a value. We overwrite what's there. And the next one, it's an optional setter, which in the case of a map, um, at number three, which doesn't exist in this map, it will actually create the key value pair in the map for you. So if the value is there at that key, at three, it will set it to that value. If it's not present, it will create it in the map. And plus, you can also do this. You can still just run a function on a value at location. Um, and you'll just have to handle the option yourself. Or you could use um, a prism called underscore just, which just walks right over an optional value and lets you treat it as if it wasn't there. Um, so this is a fun one I just found this morning that I just had to throw in. So if we want to modify a map inside state t, setting a new value if one exists, creating a new key value pair if it doesn't exist, and returning the previous value if one was there, is just that. We walk to that lens. We want to go to at foo on our map. And then set the value to be 37 at that key. And if it's there, it'll become 37. If it's not there, we get a new key value in the map, which is foo 37. Um, rapidly running out of time. I didn't think that would happen. So there's also functions uh, called, sort of called the of family in Lens. So there's like traverse, uh, I traverse, which is an index traverse. So if you need the index for the thing you're traversing over, you can use that function. And the function you have to pass to it will be given both the index and the value. Um, the of indicates that you will be able to pass a lens. And the traverse will run on the target of that lens. So if you want to traverse something deep down in a structure and run a monadic operation on it, you can target the camel names four levels deep and just say traverse of print. And that's it. You'll get the results, you, and, the results and the behavior we expect. Um, the way I learned lenses was predominantly uh, haddock diving, so the documentation on package. Um, and just playing in the REPL, loading up the REPL, importing the lens package, and just having some idea of what I needed to do, and then seeing if I could make lens do it for me. Additionally, I just give a shout out to the Let's Lens introductory course. Um, it has a couple of different streams in it that builds up knowledge and um, understanding of lenses. Uh, from first principles. 
So you build up your getters, setters, traversals, and prisms, and all of the underlying architecture. Um, and I can't recommend just trying it out yourself. Um, skip the theory for now. Get the library and just give it a while. Um, I think you'll be very impressed with how far you can go. Um, and I think I've prattled on and confused plenty of you enough. So, thank you. That goes for pretty much anything, too. If you have a REPL, you're like halfway there. Types of the rest. <laughs> uh, okay, well, we're out of time. There's no time for questions. But if you have questions, uh, I'm sure Sean will be hanging around uh, after the conference was finished for the day. So please follow up with him. And